In this week's video, we'll review the latest charts and data to help us understand why inflection point setups say a big move may be coming in stocks. We'll be moving quickly, so feel free to use the pause button on your video player. Concerns about the global banking system continue to grab headlines this week. And thus far, monitoring stock prices has been a good way to monitor risk. Things look concerning Friday morning and improved significantly before the close. This is the yield curve based on the two-year and the 10-year treasury. The yield curve is inverted when it's below zero, so this is the zero line here. You can see early this morning, around 8.48 a.m. Eastern Time, and over the past few days, we've had a spike higher, moving closer to the zero line. From a timing perspective, it's nothing particularly alarming other than it's a possible pay closer attention type signal. You can see this move here started in August of the year 2000. This move here is May of 2007. It's the same chart here as of the close on Thursday. And it's something we'll continue to keep an eye on. You can read this tweet in the lower left-hand corner from Jason Furman. Anyone that's been involved with the markets for the past 20 or 30 years has been conditioned that the Fed is always going to step in in an aggressive manner when things get dicey. And that, for the most part, has been the Fed's track record dating back at least to the early 1990s. One thing we have to keep in mind, between 1990 and let's say 2020, inflation was not really a problem. Thus, it's difficult for the Fed to meet current market expectations, which are a pause at the next meeting, followed by five consecutive meetings with a 25 basis point cut. Now, that absolutely may happen. That's going to be very, very difficult if inflation remains elevated. It's possible if things got very dicey in the banking system, in the markets and in the economy that something like this might occur, so we have to keep an open mind. It's also possible that this forecast here by the market will be amended significantly in the coming weeks and months. We'll just have to see how it plays out. Now, this is market expectations Friday morning. This is fair to ask and answer. Did trading in the bond market, especially in bond ETFs on Friday, match this type of expectation, which is super super accommodative relative to the Fed. Upper right-hand corner of your screen, this is IEF, 7 to 10 year treasury ETF. This is the trading session on Friday up here. This is the session high. It looked like a risk off breakout or a favorable bullish breakout for IEF. And then by the end of the day, it came back to basically the flat line and lost that breakout. Very, very similar situation here with TLT. This is TLT at the end of the week. If this is really what's going to happen, you would want to load up on TLT, or at a minimum, own some IEF and TLT if the Fed's going to cut rates five times in the next six meetings. So again, all of this may happen, but if it's going to happen, most likely TLT will get out into this white space and IEF will do the same up here. That's to be determined. NASDAQ new highs minus new lows covered many times. This is as of Thursday's close. This chart did not improve on Friday. This data came in somewhere in the neighborhood of negative 291 on Friday, meaning we're still not taking on a new bull market. Look, that may change very, very soon, but it hasn't changed yet. Major low in the stock market here, October of 2002. This is the retest in the spring of 2003. You can see the data only comes back to the dotted line. It's even better after the major stock market low in March of 2009. We don't even come back to the dotted line. This is what we've done recently. It may improve, but this is a disappointing look relative to the fact that we did get in to the box. Here's some potential good news for the stock market bulls. In 2002, couldn't get above the zero line. 2008, can't clear the zero line or at a minimum fail near it. A lot stronger in 2009, quite a bit better in 2003. Unlike last week, we were able to carry this look above the zero line into the close on Friday. The chart on your screen is as of Thursday's close. This positive figure here ticked up a bit during Friday's session. The longer above and the more confident the move, 
the more relevant it becomes. Weekly clouds. The thicker the cloud, the higher the possible or potential resistance. So even if the NASDAQ can print a higher weekly high above this high here, this represents potential resistance in this band here. The type of yield curve inversion that we now have in the books aligns with this quote from Powell on March 21st, 2022. So approximately a year ago, where he said, that means the Fed's going to cut, which means the economy is weak. This would have been a great question for Powell at this week's press conference. Do you still feel that way? His answer may be, it still means the economy is weak, but a year ago, I thought inflation would be lower today. It's not going to be as easy for the Fed to cut at this juncture. Doesn't mean they're not going to cut. Two big variables there would be banks slash economy and inflation. It's a conference board from their website, their latest reading in January of this year, pegs the odds of a recession in the next 12 months at 99%. Even the Fed's forecast this week, for the most part, implied that we're going to go into a recession sometime in the next 12 months. And as noted down here, thus far, the data that we have in hand, inflation is still high, and demand really hasn't waned in a meaningful way. All of that may change very, very soon, but it hasn't changed yet. And if this is true, and this is true, then historically, the stock market, for the most part, typically does not bottom before a recession starts. Very, very possible 2023 will be the exception to that rule. But probabilities say if we go into a recession, the stock market most likely, based on history, is going lower. And even if you take out 2000 and 2008, as we've covered in the past, the average earnings per share decline for the S&P 500 during a recession is approximately 20%. If that were to happen, we start running into valuation questions relative to where the S&P closed on Friday. You can find this on our Twitter feed, at Shivako Capital. Even if you're not on Twitter, you can Google at Shivako Capital, scroll down and find this tweet. Once again, a ray of bullish hope here. Closed in the black above the zero line at the end of the week. Not earth shattering, but quite a bit better than this turnaround look here or this rejected look here in 2002. Similar situation. MACD, unlike the last two weeks, was able to close above zero, and we closed above this downward sloping trend line on the weekly chart and above an upward sloping 200 week. Again, not earth shattering, but it's a lot better than getting rejected here and having this roll over this week. All of that may happen next week, but thus far, looking pretty good. Fed's balance sheet, tweet on the 19th. If the next moves by the Fed are more hikes, they raised rates this week. They say they're going to raise rates one more time. That's to be determined. And they said quantitative tightening is ongoing. And these spikes are not as relevant. There's absolutely positively no question. The liquidity shown on this chart or the change in this chart is quite a bit different in terms of the mechanics and the objectives relative to QE. When the Fed performs QE, they remove a treasury bond or some similar security from circulation and cash gets pumped in to the economy with no specific promise or date as to when that cash may or may not be removed. It's quite a bit different than what's going on here with the discount window. The banks are pledging a security, getting cash on a short term basis. It's a loan that needs to be paid back and then they'll get the security back. The special facilities that they have are also closed-ended in terms of time. You can pledge a security, give it to the Fed, they'll give you cash for the most part, and you can keep that cash for up to a year. That's quite a bit different from QE. Still relevant, but still quite a bit different. A little more about that topic here, here, and here. You can pause your video player said some good things have happened relative to the NASDAQ. If you want to take this case and this case off the table, you'd really like to see weekly RSI exceed this number here, which is 59.76. We closed Friday at 54. This look here, when you zoom in on the Bollinger Band, 
also looks better than anything that we've seen looking back here. Still has work to do. For the most part, still in a range even as of Friday's close. This is Thursday. It's really the conviction that's the question here. See this move right here? That's a high conviction look after the retest in the S&P 500 in March of 2003. March of 2009, S&P comes off the bottom, a high conviction move, and you really never drop down below the green line for the most part, and you never drop down below the orange line. Never drop down below the orange line. Well, that's where we are earlier this week. Not the end of the world, but if good things are going to happen, data like this, breath data, needs to improve, and most likely it needs to improve with some conviction. Potential resistance, anchored volume weighted average price based on the bull market high here. So even if the NASDAQ rallies, this represents an area of potential resistance somewhat similar to this potential resistance, potential or possible resistance. It's a reference point. So for now, the NASDAQ for the most part is still in a range or in no man's land. Not too bad, not great. S&P 500 daily cloud. This is as of the close on Friday. We came up into the cloud earlier in the week. This is potential resistance near 4,000. We didn't move on Friday in any way to alter this look. We've got this downward sloping trend line here and we're still below the upward sloping trend line from the October 2022 low. This was Friday morning on Twitter at 9.02 a.m. when things looked really, really ugly. Good way to calm down. The futures were sitting around 39.50 at 9.02 a.m. So a lot of noise recently. If you go back and look at recent videos or look at this chart in the Twitter feed, it's hard to tell the difference between the days when the s and is up 22 points or down 60 points. It's the weekly chart as of Friday's close. Good news, we're still holding above these areas here, still holding above this downward sloping trend line. Bad news, we've been making a series of lower highs for several weeks, and momentum is clearly waning in the short run, but not the end of the world here. But if you're a bull, you'd really like to see this momentum turn up soon. Well, let's talk a little bit more about this topic from a bullish perspective. If you just look at math relative to trends between the October low and the present day, there's still a lot of significant improvement. How do we know that? The model measures that type of improvement and it's significant improvement. It's telling us to keep an open mind about the possibility of a break in this direction. And this is the try to be patient. The market's been going sideways for quite some time now. A lot of wild swings this week, but we really didn't move clearly above or below this area. Typically, when you get a converging trend look like this, so this is the 50-day all the way out to the 200 in orange, so we're converging on multiple time frames, usually you're going to get a relatively sharp move either in this direction or in this direction. From a concerning perspective, after this type of breakout here, this is really weaker than what we would expect from a historical perspective. So for example, we had breath thrusts from here to here. This is pretty disappointing relative to history and it tells us we don't have much rope relative to those thrusts from January. And you can even make an argument that we don't have any rope yet. We're still holding above this low here and we're still holding above the December low. This is from last week and all of this Still true. S&P 500 weekly, flipping the script. The last two weeks, weekly momentum was positive intra-week. It couldn't hold it into the end of the week. This week's just the opposite. On Thursday, PPO and MACD weekly were negative. By the end of the week, they both finished positive. It's a subtle shift. All you need to do is look at MACD here and see there's really no advantage with momentum in recent weeks. See this wick up here, a reversal, a wick, a reversal, wick, wick, reversal. Doesn't predict anything, but there's a lot of rejection looks up in here. 
Similar situation here between roughly 4,200-ish, maybe 4,288-ish in the December low down here, somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,750-ish, 3,770-ish. For the most part, we're in a try to be patient range while managing risk and positions at the same time. S&P 500 still above an upward sloping 200 week. Here's the upward sloping weekly trend line from the October low. We've been below it now for three weeks. Tried to recapture the 20 week moving average and you can see the little wick up here. We weren't able to do it. Daily cloud, Friday's close potential resistance. We're near the pivot. S&P 500 daily cloud near potential resistance in here in the vicinity of the daily pivot area of resistance here around 4100 and a little bit above 4200 as of the close on Friday. We have that price coiling equilibrium type look in here on the weekly. This is Friday's close. If really, really good things are going to happen. We absolutely positively know that the S&P 500 has to break 4,200 and for the most part, move away from it. That may happen very, very soon. It just hasn't happened yet. You can see we're back into the drawdown band relative to the breath thrust that we covered on February 10th. Weekly charts, potential resistance with the cloud. First pass up here, we were rejected. We're below the pivot point here between 41 and 4,000. On the weekly, the next areas of resistance relative to the pivot come in at 4,600 and all the way up in the 5,000s. Got to clear these hurdles first, have not done so. It's a good visual here. You can see a few weeks back earlier in the year, we had a nice strong look here, but we were rejected in the cloud near a logical area right in that 4,100 to 4,200 range. It's difficult to look at this chart in its present form and not acknowledge that it needs to improve to erase what is now a still concerning and vulnerable look. We've covered this many, many times. Why are these concepts relevant? Weekly momentum fails near zero here in 2002. It fails near zero here in 2008. We look a little bit better in 2023, but momentum is still weakening in here, but at least it's positive at the end of the week. Why is this in 08 relevant and this in 02 relevant? Because if you turn down near zero, really bad things can happen. If you go look at the S&P 500 daily from this peak here in 2002 to the final closing low on the daily chart in October of 2002, the S&P loses an additional 33.63% between point A and point B, and it does so in 204 calendar days. It's an acceleration to the downside, the last leg of the bear market. Similar situation here. You fail, turn down below the zero line up here. This is May of 2008 from the closing price, the high here in May of 08, to the low in March of 2009. Over the next 294 calendar days from A to B, the S&P lost an additional 52.58%. Not a prediction in any shape, form, or fashion. It's just saying after a period of consolidation, if we break to the downside, that would be concerning. That hasn't happened yet, and the consolidation here and the math here does look more constructive than this point here and this point here telling us to keep an open mind about this being meaningful, but we're still way too close to that zero line and too vulnerable to let our guard down. A similar situation here, end of the week. RSI weekly, not very impressive, closed below 50. We'd really like to see it exceed 55 for the most part. Nothing magical about that, but it starts to distance us from those two periods we just covered. 2002, 2008. This is Thursday's close, but it's not a great look. Market leader fails underneath the weekly cloud. All is not lost, but odds would improve significantly if we can get back out here. Friday, the S&P 500 rallied off the low, somewhere in the order of 60 points, finished about 60 points off the low. By the way, the day before we finished roughly 
60 points off the session high, but it wasn't a convincing move. Up volume at the end of the day was a tepid 62%. More vulnerable here. We're down near the anchored VWAP tied to the COVID high and the COVID low, but thus far are holding. Now this chart speaks for itself. This is the overhead supply up here. Came up to it, we failed. We have work to do here. End of the week, MYSE daily. It's the 50 day out to the 250 day. End of the week, the big chart. It's a 195 minute MYSE composite cloud chart. We're below the cloud. This is the October low. This is the angle off the October low. Testing it now, if you're a bull, you'd really like to get back up here. Somewhere along the line, either in last week's video or on Twitter, we mentioned this. This is a positive divergence with breath here. You can pause your video player. It's still in place. Similar situation here. Dow Jones composite, not a great look, not what we're looking for. Needs to improve really, really soon. Below the volume base line tied to the October low below the one tied to the bull market high. Longer below, the more meaningful it becomes, and these are also areas of potential support. Thursday, not a lot of improvement on Friday. Here's the look. 200-day moving average for the MYSC composite. You can say this is a laggard. Yes, it's a laggard, but if the low was already in place, you typically get a conviction turn in the 200-day. So the fact that we started a conviction turn in the 200 day and then lost it, it's just, it's not a high conviction look. This is really not debatable. This is the downward sloping trend line for the bear market. The MYSE composite broke out, left shoulder head, right shoulder. And right now that's a failed breakout below the trend line. And on Friday, closing below the 200 day. Potentially good news, this appears to be a higher intraday low relative to this low. You got to start somewhere. This is a monthly chart, so it's not the end of the month, but this is not a good look. You pause your video player here. Momentum rolling over, momentum rolling over, momentum rolling over. This is a weekly chart. Black is below red at the end of the week. Really doesn't look like 2009 really doesn't look like the successful retest in 2003. Is it possible to turn up near the zero line? Absolutely, positively, yes, it's possible. Not a lot of discernible improvement here on Friday. This is Thursday. It speaks for itself. Dow Thursday has that failed cloud breakout look. Now this is potential resistance. Also somewhat in VWAP, anchored VWAP. No man's land, but notably underneath the blue line tied to the October low. Longer below, the more meaningful it becomes. Potential support down here. Similar situation here we've covered in the past. You'd really like to see this get to the other side. So far, the weekly cloud is acting as resistance. This is at the end of the week. This could be potentially good news here, telling us that this could be a period of consolidation and eventually we're going to break out. We've lost the trend line from the October low and below the daily cloud at the end of the week. This is the end of the week. It speaks for itself. HYG divided by IEI. It's making a new low here. JNK divided by BIL. This is your risk on look. This is the October low. This is what's been ha happening in recent weeks. COVID high. COVID lows, the blue line, bull market high, price has never been able to get above those lines. Simply reference points. We've covered this. 2009, we want to see this. We want to see this, 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 and this. We're having trouble at the cloud thus far. See the conviction move through the cloud and the conviction move through the cloud. Thus far, that's not high conviction. There's some potentially good news here. Here's a leader held weekly cloud here on March 3rd, closed above the cloud this week. So we still have price above red, blue above red, price above a cloud that is now green and the cloud has flipped from red to green. It's not great, but it's a lot better than being down here. 
Like JNK, this is acting as resistance. It says something potentially about interest rates in the US dollar. This is a little bit more encouraging. LQD divided by IEF weekly. We've covered it many times. You can find this chart in our Twitter feed if you're patient and scroll down. Was up for the full week, 0.7%, still hanging in there. Momentum, vulnerable. Tech sector on Friday, potential resistance in the weekly cloud. Closed right up here near the top of the cloud on Friday. This is Microsoft. MSFT at the end of the week also into the cloud. We'll learn something either way. There's absolutely improvement here in the look of the cloud. This still looks better than anything that we saw back in here. Just has some hurdles to cross. Now XLK divided by SPY has basically been going straight up. This is Thursday night I believe and we have a 9-12 on that ratio. You can see up here this is your 913. This is December. So late in 2022, the S&P 500 peaks right here. So a 913 here would be potential trend exhaustion. See how we blew right through this one? Have to be open to that 913 turning out to be bullish instead of bearish, but we'll see. Broad S&P 1500 index has not been able to clear the weekly cloud. You can see the conviction move in 2009, a conviction move above the cloud after the final low in 2016, and a conviction move back above the cloud after the COVID low here. A daily chart here, still somewhat in no man's land here. This is potential support. We would learn something if we move into this white space or if we can get back above the green line. This is your price coiling up look, your equilibrium look. See how the lines are coming together, telling us to be open to a big move in either direction. If the Fed's going to cut rates 25 basis points at five out of the next six meetings, pretty confident that this will not act as resistance and we will get to the other side. That's to be determined. Not a confidence-inspiring look over here. I think it's fair to say we have sideways movement that could be getting ready to make a decision one way or another soon. Can price continue to go sideways? Sure it can. The market can do anything it wants to do. Bullet points up here from last week's video. It's rare down here and head snapping. It looked like risk on and quickly lost this level here Close below this level here at the end of the week, tight cluster here. You can read this on your own. It speaks to one of the problems with the banks that can't necessarily be fixed by FDIC insurance limits. It speaks to higher interest rates and opportunity costs. Still make an argument, this is your head, and we're trying to build the right side of the base potentially over here. We came down recently and held in this area here. We're back above this area here and back above this gap. Credit markets also have somewhat of a basing look, but we have a downward sloping neckline. That's not really what you want, but not too bad. It's definitely a base that we're building. And like many charts, potential and relatively thick here, cloud resistance right at the cloud. Still testing this area here at the end of the week and above the 30-week moving average, which looks like it's trying to turn back up positive on the week. That's the good news. The bad news would be momentum, really not confidence-inspiring relative to the chart in front of us. VEA looks even better here because we're above this level and above this level. If you're relatively new to the markets, what is CDS? It's a credit default swap. Think of it as an insurance policy against a bond default. So when they spike up like this, it speaks to increasing odds that a company could potentially default on their bonds. Seen a lot of rare moves lately. BKLN, leveraged loans, aka riskier loans. Looking good here in early March. Now we've lost the upward sloping trend line from the October low. The longer below, the more meaningful it becomes. You can read this over here. 
S&P 500 makes a stand here in 2011, makes a stand here at the COVID low in 2020. If we move up, resistance on this ratio here, resistance on the same ratio here, testing the same basic trend line today. We went above it intraweek, finished the week down 0.85%, also moving sideways with a tight look. Not predicting that it's going to fail here or break out. We'll just learn something. This is XLF monthly. It's very, very difficult to say XLF being down roughly 13% month to date is confidence inspiring. This is not a particularly good look on the monthly cloud relative to red and blue. Month's not over yet. One thing we probably know for sure, the intervention from policymakers it's probably not over yet. We may get something even Sunday night. Same ratio with ETFs above the weekly cloud, looking good five for five at the moment. However, it hasn't broken out yet. If you look at a daily chart, it's right up here. See, there's no clear winner between GLD and SPY yet. Reason for optimism? You can read it. In its present form, this is somewhat saying cash on a weekly basis is better than the S&P 500. It looked like that was changing here in Q1 of this year in January. Now it's just indecisive. Notice here, the weekly momentum sitting right on the zero line. We'll learn something relative to where this goes up here or down here, or it could still continue to go sideways. This is EFA monthly. Once you get the cross here in 2003, the low is in. Once you come down here, that's the key. You gotta come down below this line here, and then once you get the cross, the low is in. 2019, drop below, get the cross, the low in the S&P is in. We have this. It doesn't matter that there's a few days left in the month. At the end of last month, full stochastic was at 69.35 above 50. Doesn't guarantee us anything, but probably fair to say it looks like that, that, and that in its present form. All right, a lot going on here on QQQ. Daily over here, left side over here, has not broken out yet above the 200 day, 50 day turning up. If you pause your video player and look at the big chart, which is a weekly chart, this is still constructive, this and this. And remember, this look here, Early stages of a new trend. Early stages of a new trend. If it comes late in a trend, it's more concerning. Has work to do. Potential, like see how it's right up against the cloud? Got a ton of these charts that are bumping up against their weekly clouds. Made a higher weekly high here, up top, but there's a divergence. Not the end of the world, but it's there. We also have that 913 that's still in force that doesn't predict anything. It speaks to odds. If the Fed's going to cut rates, 25 basis points at five of the next six meetings, this won't look like this. And it's possible that global stocks will move away from the 200-day moving average. And if they're going to cut that much, it's possible it could go in this direction. It's also possible it could go in this direction if you look at the cuts over time. A lot of times this late in a cycle when the Fed cuts, it's not particularly a good thing. How do we know we still have a problem in the banking system? The stocks of banks are still trading like yo-yos. Until that calms down, it's concerning. Stock markets move off the October low is impressive in many ways. What do we mean by that? It's not subjective, it's objective. For the most part, the market checked every box relative to this no longer looks like a bear market rally. With one possible exception, clearing those weekly momentum hurdles. Very similar to June 2020 after the thrusts in that period, the drawdowns are bigger than what you would expect historically. Based on the first bullet point up here, it's very possible the next eight months will look significantly different relative to the last eight months. If, with the emphasis being placed on if, we break to the downside, 2002 and 2008 tell us turning down when momentum is near zero on the weekly chart can be painful. Having said that, 
There's no question, 2023 can check a lot of boxes that you could not check at that point in 2002, nor 2008. Still having trouble with those weekly charts. Balance sheet expansion does have an impact on the markets, but it's not QE. What do we mean by don't get stuck on a story and don't get stuck on a timeline? It's very, very possible if you're convinced that the debt bubble needs to pop, that that may indeed happen at some point. But it's also possible that it doesn't happen out of the present setups. So we don't want to get stuck on a story, bullish or bearish, or on a time frame. Take it day by day and see how it unfolds. Markets always have countless moving parts. Could probably multiply this bullet point here by a factor of a thousand in the present day. This bullet point and this bullet point speak to humility. Kathy and Chris, you, nobody, including anyone on Twitter, and includes the largest firms. Nobody has 100% of the relevant info relative to what's driving markets here. Nobody has 100% of the answers. And that humility allows us to be flexible. Want to get stuck on this nor this. Let's talk in hypotheticals for a moment. Assume a major inflation report was coming Monday morning of next week. Again, hypothetical. And let's assume that that inflation report came in way better than expected. Inflation was much lower than expectations. Well, that would solve a lot of issues. And under that scenario, you could easily see the market breaking to the upside. Conversely, if that report came out hypothetically on Monday morning and inflation was much higher than expected, it's very, very easy to envision that weekly momentum rolling over and the market failing in a similar manner to what we saw in 2002 and 2008. The bottom line is inflation is a major wild card relative to any scenario. Thus, as we all know, the only way any of this is going to work with all of these indecisive chart patterns and a mixed bag of information is if we head into next week and every week with that flexible, unbiased, and open mind. The material in this video has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs of any viewer. This video is presented solely for informational purposes and is not to be construed as a solicitation or an offer to buy or sell any securities or any related financial instruments, nor should any of its content be taken as investment advice. Any opinions expressed in this video are subject to change without notice. And Shivako Capital Management, LLC, or CCM, is not under any obligation to update or keep current the information contained herein. CCM and its respective officers and associates, or clients, may have an interest in the securities or derivatives of any entities referred to in this material. CCM accepts no liability whatsoever for any loss or damage of any kind arising out of the use of all or any part of this material. We recommend that you consult with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision.